Well, welcome to uh, Mistakes I Have Made. Um, my name is Bill Templeman. I'm uh, going to share some ideas that have come out of the past uh, three and a half years of podcasting. I host a podcast that we're up to now, I think 107 episodes. Uh, it's called Pints and Politics. It's um, sort of a hybrid beast. It's it's a program on Trent Radio, a weekly program, discussion-based program on politics and various other themes. And uh, each week when I do an original, a new show, I convert it to a podcast and post it on uh, Peter Brown Independent Podcasters on PIP site. So um, now... <laughs> say at the beginning i have no formal training in this right i mean everything i do at trent radio has um has been um you know based on my years of uh, being a cbc radio listener and so on and of course the support of all the staff at trent radio and i pip of course aisha and jeff and so on everyone who's uh, helped out on the technical side so if you're looking for you know what microphones to use and and what sort of uh, technology and tricks uh, you know, not me uh this is more on the human side of uh, running panel discussions for podcasts so what i'm going to do is just share my screen and take you through a few uh powerpoints all right, so um, there's the contact info, and uh, you know, for people who uh, you've attended, I'll, I'll you know, we'll send this out as well. Uh, it just uh, in passing, something I, I haven't included as a slide, but something that bears discussion uh, at some point, maybe at the end, is uh, how to promote your podcast. Now I'm on Facebook and Twitter. I've also started posting uh, on. Um, Instagram and occasionally on LinkedIn. Um, so I, I've discovered that it's not enough uh, to just like, well, in the print world, it's not enough anymore to write your novel, your book of poems and just put it out there and say, well, universe, make me famous. No, you've got to go out and do speaking tours and promote and show up at bookstores and blah, blah, blah. Well, the same thing with podcasts, you have to uh, get it out there on social media, let people know uh, anyway. So uh, here we are, this is Studio A at Trent Radio and I stuck this in there. Uh, this is about a 1970s, 1980s <laughs> technology, if that. It's a pretty primitive radio station. I had Jordan Mercier in who's on uh, 90.7 FM, he's a sports broadcaster, uh, in for, we did a program on hockey, and he came into the studio and he chuckled, you know, because it's, sort of, it's just like, but it works. And um, uh, as I was saying uh, before we started uh, to Aisha, uh, not only is the technology there, but um, there are people there who know the technology. And so starting out back in uh, 2018, when things would go wrong, there'd be someone to rush in and help me. So, uh, and I show this another reason too, for the first year, well, really up until March, 2020, a uh, year, almost a year and a half ago, um, my my files that I would turn into podcasts would be, for the most part, recorded here on this equipment. So the sound wasn't bad. Those are decent microphones. And uh, I would just go home and download a file from uh, the Trent Radio, Trent Radio website. And voila, there would be my MP3 and I could edit away on Audacity. And so uh, the sound quality was quite good since the pandemic, of course, I've been recording at home on my uh, my uh, laptop, and uh, you know the quality isn't the same. So that's that's another issue. Um, so first point is, uh, you know, in, in hosting panel discussions, there's the temptation to uh, insert a lot about yourself and your own views and opinions, and um, my experience has been, or my, I don't know if experience is the right, my insight has been that unless I have really unique qualifications for a given topic, what I think about 
let's say we were discussing something fairly controversial, uh, uh, something to do with um, right to die legislation or situation in the Middle East between Israel and Palestinians. I mean, I have no qualifications for either topic. So why should I foist my opinion on my listeners? Uh, and on the contrary side is, uh, you know, as a podcaster, you, you put in a lot of time and effort into producing an episode. So you deserve something in return. And my thought is you have a chance to at least add something. So how do I balance out the first and the second? Well, that's it. It's a question of getting that balance right. Uh, now, um, it's, it's a question of degree, right? I mean, um, so maybe the Goldilocks analogy holds true, not too hot, not too cold, just right. So it's a question of striking that and maybe a good way to get that balance between inserting yourself too much into a panel discussion and just being a very neutral process oriented voice is to ask for feedback from uh, other podcasters. Um, so, uh, Spontaneity versus scripting and writing it out down, all down. Now, there's nothing that bores me more um, as a listener than listening to someone read, even a good reader. Uh, I prefer listening to discussions, but it's one of the paradoxes, it seems, of of, uh, blah, of uh, podcasting that, uh, and indeed radio broadcasting, if it's not written down, you won't get it right, no matter how smooth you think you are. And believe me, I am not smooth in terms of the ums and the ahs and losing my place. So to say what you want to say, uh, write it down first, then, then you can read what you want. It's sort of a paradox. The more you have written down, uh, then you're free to break the rules. You're, you're free to go off script. But you have a script to come home to if you get lost, so that's important. So to live in the moment and speak the truth, you really have to be prepared and then uh, gives you some, some freedom to go off script. Uh, to go off script, as I, oh, I just made that point, come back to it. Uh, now, listening to you wing it is not always as enjoyable as it is for you doing the winging. Um, now, to go on a tangent is fine. And... Many of my podcasts include some of that. And sometimes it's a podcast that one of the guests brings up. Sometimes I introduce it. And it's great, but it can get old. And tangents can go on for uh, maybe a few seconds, a few minutes too long. Uh, so sympathy for your listeners. What is your listeners' experience? Uh, do they sense you respect their time? I mean, if so, uh, they'll stay on board with you and they'll listen to you. They'll stay for the ride. If not, uh, you know, a, a community radio station like, no, I'm speaking of podcasting here, but because all my podcasts start as radio broadcasts, uh, it's also the radio listeners. So my two cents, and it's only my opinion, this is not the gospel from on high, but is that, uh, you know, time is not infinite. Uh, life is not forever. So don't waste your listeners time. Like don't make them listen to you think, which is what I hear sometimes. And I hear it still even on the CBC, like take out all your ums and your ahs and your fillers and your repetitions. Now, over and against that, there are those who say, no, no, I want live radio. I want to hear people interacting as they would uh, walking on a street or sitting down for coffee or something. And that's fine. But again, it's a question of balance. Uh, listening to me talk, as I would socially, includes a lot of stuff that's not really important. A lot of throat clearing and mm, you know well um stuff that takes up time so uh, i use i happen to use audacity uh i use that to take out certainly my own fillers the ums and the ahs and um it also makes my guests sound reasonably thoughtful but i've learned through feedback from listeners not to get too disciplined in terms of uh uh 
making the space between comments too tight or if I take out an um I think I'll go for a bicycle ride um if it doesn't rain well I can take out the um but if I make that space therefore too tight between the two words bike ride if it doesn't rain it, it sounds very mechanical so, so uh, leave some space uh, by the way speaking of uh, uh, leaving space and discussion. If anyone has a comment, just just jump right in. And uh, I have a I have a, a funny little anecdote to to kind of go. Oh, please that fits with that. I, I when I worked at the CBC, one of my uh, colleagues, she would do the edits on these uh, long radio shows, and she like hated people saying um and like and all the filler words. So her strategy was to get a a little clip of someone breathing, like a little breath before they start talking and she just had that saved it, uh, for every single person in this piece so that she, when she edited out an um she would add that breath in so oh, brilliant and, and it sounded perfectly natural it was, in, it was incredible um yeah so that's like a, a a funny flip side to that where you can kind of get away with it if you've got the right little tips and tricks that's, that's, <laughs> that's great well and i mean you're you're uh Actually, I appreciate your, your intro. I mean, how many of us can say when I worked at the CBC? <laughs> My, the second person I interviewed way back, I mean, you remind me of an anecdote. Um, second person I interviewed, the first was Zach Hatton, who was 18 years old at the time. He was running for city council and he bravely came on and uh, you know, he was very patient. My second guest, the very second person I had, because I sent out this invitation to everyone running for city council, if you want me to be on Trent Radio and do a podcast, you know, happy to do that. And so 21 of the 28 candidates uh, signed up. So that was great. Um, and so my second was uh, Dave McGowan, who I didn't realize had spent like 12 years at checks, a very experienced broadcaster. And he was one of those, those individuals who talks perfectly so you know i talk with um uh you know and i think about well no maybe i should you know i bumble along as I, I talk on air and here he was talking it was like pouring you know thick cream you know it was just <laughs> no splashing it was just really uh, fine and uh in contrast to my own babbling so that was quite an experience anyway um yeah no thanks for that uh another side to uh, sympathy for your listeners is uh musical breaks now because um, and I, I vary from this when i'm just doing a podcast that's not going to be a radio broadcast but my radio um, slot is one hour or about 55 minutes actually so when i so there's a station break usually in the middle, but when I convert it to a podcast, I uh, insert music, uh, short breaks, uh, maybe two or three times, and they fit in best uh, when we're changing topics. And again, feedback from listeners is that it, because I asked a few people once I started doing that, because I figured, hey, it'll sound cool and put in music. Mm, I don't know what I'm doing. And now, I, of course, because it was pod, uh, and I'm sure you know a lot more about this than I do, um, because I was doing that for a podcast, of course, it couldn't be um, a top 40 hit. It couldn't be, it had to be Creative Commons music. So I have some, there's a Creative Commons site online. So I've downloaded some mostly electronica sort of music that's free to use so I don't I don't violate anyone's copyright that way by inserting it into the podcast uh, enunciate clearly uh, I tend to mumble and not open my mouth widely enough and so <laughs> pay attention to that uh, don't speed read through announcements like talk radio uh, a colleague uh, I've worked with that at uh, Fleming, uh, I'm sure he wouldn't mind. Uh, Jack Rowe um, spent, has spent years uh, broadcasting uh, on Toronto radio, and um, he manages to, you know, when he was on air, he's retired now, but he, when he was on air, he'd managed to get through a lot of material very efficiently, but you could understand him. 
now when I'm driving into Toronto and I listen to uh, 680 News to catch what's happening ahead in traffic, I really have trouble taking it all in because they read so quickly that um, it, it's, well, I find it hard to listen. Anyway, um, explain all your references. Uh, for example, uh, if you're talking about cultural life in Peterborough on your podcast, you make a reference to Reframe. Well, those of us who live in Peterborough sure know what Reframe is. It's an, uh, this great annual film fest, um, a weekend film festival. But if you don't live in Peterborough, you probably don't. I mean, Reframe is not yet that famous. Uh, it's not on the level of hot docs in Toronto. So, I mean, explain your references. That's what I'm trying to spit out. Um, and I just included this lovely little... Um, graphic because often that's what panel discussions are all about you aim at your target and then something throws you off um, you plan what's going to happen for a program and it's happened to me a few times doing points in politics uh, I remember I had this program all planned out had my questions all written out knew where I wanted to go with the panel discussion, had my guests all set. It was my regular politics panel. And the afternoon, about five hours before I was to go on air, uh, Trudeau's uh, blackface scandal broke. <laughs> and you know, there goes my script. <laughs> so I, when you're doing anything to do with current affairs and politics, of course, and we dealt with it. We, we talked about the breaking news and the impact. And uh, anyway, um, so plan your uh, panel discussions, whether you're doing a panel discussion or a one-on-one -on -one interview, uh, plan it in advance, know where you want to get to, write your questions down in advance, and always use make up far more questions than you need, you know, uh, because a good set of questions allows for the tangents. Uh, my, my, my paranoia in doing live radio, which is an, I mean, the great thing about podcasting, it's a recording. So if you make a blooper, say something wrong, or just uh, go on a tangent that relates to nothing, you can take it out. When you're doing live radio, the closest analogy I've come to, it's like rock climbing, the difference between top roping, which is when the rope is attached to a tree at the top of the cliff, and lead climbing, where you're, you're carrying a rope, but you're putting in pieces of metal or pitons in the way up the cliff, and uh, you can fall <laughs> a long way if you're not careful. So, um, that's what I guess having a good set of questions gives you this sense of protection. Um, yeah, and just in creating your questions, uh, I usually do it, try to do it a few days before. Don't assume your listeners know what you know. I mean, we all like to think, well, everyone knows that. Well, no, maybe not. And assume a diverse audience in terms of. Um, knowledge of whatever field you're talking about, uh, age, um, you know, familiarity with the terms you use, comfort with, uh, with language, um, yeah, that's always wise to do. Um, now, uh, another opinion I have, and it's not how I, I'm good at this one, is like, Certainly try not to single out a single, uh, an individual panel member by directing a question right at them. And because they may not be ready to answer me, they may be daydreaming, they may be doodling, they may be doing something on their phone, oh, who knows. Um, and the, or th they simply may not want to answer at that point. So uh, I float questions out um, 
and I they're fairly long the question and I think of uh, and I justify that in my own mind is I think of them like trays of appetizers now you don't have to eat every single appetizer on the tray when someone offer comes around uh, you get to pick and choose so maybe you skip the wasabi and you take the brie cheese you know whatever I mean so ditto with questions uh, I try to ask a few questions at the same time so people can pick and choose because my goal is is you know it's not like a, a, a prosecutor in a courtroom I, i'm not out to grill someone for the truth my, my whole intent a, as a host is to create a, a really good discussion and a really good discussion is a if you will it's it's a group creation i mean as a host i i can't create it i i can set the framework for it but if something magic and fun is going to happen it's going to happen between the panelists between the guests and so you that's what i try to do um you know prepping uh, prepping guests i uh try to do a volume check uh beforehand uh, particularly these days recording online uh and after a while, I know in a radio studio, this is not a problem because you can just move mics closer and you can signal to people with your hand, you know, you know, get your mouth right, you know, right close to the microphone. Um, but recording online, I've had to do a bit of preemptive, preemptive uh, warning about soft voices. I encourage them to use more volume. Uh, yeah, I find it a challenge online um the other thing is if you're working with people you don't know uh they're knowledgeable but you really don't know them that well um, and sometimes you, you know well <laughs> warn against the the encyclopedic answers the you know the 15 minute answers where two minutes would do uh you know it, describe the difference between discussion and lecture um and of course, model it yourself, you know, be brief in your question. I, now, my questions tend to ramble, but not that long. Um, and when you're recording, uh, particularly these days, recording online, uh, tell people in advance, look, I, after I ask a question, I'll, I'll stop. And if you want to take some time, take it. So I, I let pauses go on sometimes there's dead air in the raw recording of five, seven seconds, which is an eternity. And that's fine, because I, I just clipped that out uh, in the editing software. Um, and of course, encourage disagreement and debate, including uh, disagreement with my questions or people say, well, no, I would reframe it another way. That's fine. At least that's for me. Uh, uh, I ask people to identify themselves by name when they first speak, whether it's, uh, well, uh, on a podcast so that people get, oh, uh, okay, that low voice, okay, that's that's George, okay, that, that, that very musical voice, okay, that's Susan, you know, uh, because once you have a panel of four or five guests, it can get a bit scrambled. Um, and of course, <laughs> not to assume pronouns, uh, to, to ask off air, you know, before you start recording first, you know, uh, or you know, how should I refer to you uh, as a she, as a he, as, a, as them, you know, because to make those mistakes while you're recording, then, you know, it's, it's a bit more awkward. So act, ask first. Um, now, if you're recording, well, it's not only in a, well, if you're recording in a studio or taking your laptop to someone's house and recording there, uh, of course you can watch each other for signals. You know, people raise their hand and so on. Um, so uh, when you're recording online, for example, over Zoom or Teams or WebEx, something like that, um, one of those platforms, you can ask people to keep their videos on. And then when you go to start editing, of course you're, you're you'll be dealing with an MP4. Well, it's easy to convert it to an MP3. And then, you know, you, you're not using your video. Away you go. Um, keep control of the conversation. Uh, not so much by policing, but uh, by 
through the judici judicious use of questions, and, and particularly for a controversial topic, people can get quite revved up. Uh, if we were talking about the Middle East situation, I mean, I know there are strongly held opinions out there about uh, Netanyahu, the Israeli government, uh, the Palestinians, Hamas, the Rock, you know. And if you have a good set of questions, if you sense people are going off the deep end to uh, in a way that's dominating the discussion or, or being just closed to other opinions, you just put in a, another question. Uh, you know, it's your, it's your panel discussion, you're driving the bus. Um, and <clears throat> I, I may be wrong on the following point, but I don't worry about people who are not participating. In other words, uh, some, uh, and I've had, I don't know how many times the experience of noticing that someone just, you know, 15, 20 minutes into an hour long show and they're just not saying anything. Um, and I find if I leave them, then eventually they interject with this really prescient, insightful comment that, whoa, where did that, you know, so, uh, you know, the whole thing, silent, uh, silent waters sometimes run deep. Uh, yeah. Now, have I ever done this? Thanks, John. What do others think? Yes, I've done that. In other words, if someone is on and on and on, for example, the Middle East example, if someone is just going on and on and on about one side or the other, how they're, you know, wrong and abusing international law and blah, 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 blah. Uh, you, I have had to do that. But, uh, only in situations where I'm recording online, when we're face to face, all in the same room, either in a, someone's living room or a studio or something. Um, you usually work it out with hand signals. Uh, in recorded sessions, uh, uh, you can always tell people. Now, others may disagree with me in I'm terms still, of getting. Still, sorry, sure, go ahead. Sorry, you're, uh, you just moved your microphone a little bit and uh, can't hear you as well. Oh, sorry. Okay, how's that? That's okay? I think that's better, yeah. Okay, sorry. Um, in recorded sessions, you can always tell people uh, that if, uh, the, that if you, if, well, if they want to have me remove a, a remark they made in the heat of the moment afterwards, uh, you can do that. And I mean, why, why wouldn't you do that? Uh, I mean, certainly when I'm a guest, I don't like to say things that make me sound like an uninformed idiot. So if I say something that a factual mistake or just a judgment that was maybe a bit over the top, you know, I appreciate being able to take it out. And so I extend that courtesy to others. It, it seldom happens, but it has happened. Uh, and so uh, I certainly don't mind doing it, uh, you know, and with the, the editing software, it's, it's no big deal. Uh, all right, so we're winding down here. <clears throat> Uh, give your guests uh, a warning when you are about to end, and um, there are a number of ways to do that. I usually, I sometimes throw in a phrase like, okay, we're winding down here. Does anyone have any last thoughts about that? We've got about a minute and a half to go, or, or something like that. Um, now, how much is enough? Uh, interviews, if you're doing one-on-one -on -one interviews, they tend to be shorter. Uh, than a panel discussion, uh, in my experience. Um, so interviews can be short as nine minutes, so even a lot shorter. Um, panel discussions can be up, you know, can uh, be up there as far as podcasts go. Uh, unless, I now, length topic fits in there. Uh, I know as just as a listener to get me to listen to a 90 minute podcast is going to take something special. <laughs> you know, so uh, you set your, set your length according to what you think a listeners tolerances and ask for feedback. Um, in, indeed, uh, that, that should be a bullet point on this very last slide. You know, ask your listeners for feedback. Uh, Give your guests a chance to summarize so they're uh, 
they tie up the bow on their final thought, uh, tell them when it's uh, posted, and uh, ask your listeners for feedback. Uh, it does happen. I wish it happened more. Uh, and how to give it? Well, it can be on your social media platforms. I have to give up my email address. Um, and occasionally I hear from listeners. And uh, of course, in Peterborough, uh, before the pandemic, when all of us were out and about, you'd run into people and say, oh, I heard your da 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 And uh, that sometimes happens. We'll get back there. All right. And that's it. Well, thanks very much for listening. Oh, I should, speaking of winding up, does anyone, uh, I should, Jeff, anyone uh, listening, participating, any thoughts before we stop recording? Yeah, definitely. I, 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 one thing I wanted to just say is like, I think one thing you do really well in Pints and Politics is finding this balance. And, and there's so many different things to balance. Like you're, you're talking about your uh, respect to the listener and preparing your guests. Uh, I, I wanted to just ask a bit more about like, um, like you talked a bit about respecting your your listeners' time. Uh, how do, how do you kind of approach in like the editing or in the preparation process? Like how do you approach like respecting your participants or your panelists' um, positions? Like how how do you give them enough space to you know articulate their thoughts while also balancing everyone else in the room? Yeah, I, and that's really hard. Um, and I I must confess I don't always get that one right. Um, now, uh, well, uh, let me, uh, let me, uh, if I can answer your question by giving an example. Uh, occasionally we talk about municipal politics, uh, quite often, in fact, on Pints and Politics. And I, I have a regular politics panel, there's about six or seven uh, people. I don't think they've all seven of them come at one, appeared at once, but usually you get anywhere from three, four, five. And one of one of my guests is, uh, of course, Sylvia Sutherland, who's uh, still works as a journalist, uh, former mayor of Peterborough. So <laughs> here's me, uh, you know, more or less uh, a layperson's knowledge of municipal politics. I, I ran for city council once, didn't get in, so I've never sat on council. Uh, here's a woman who's been uh, held the top job for uh, close to 15, 13, 14 years, you know, since you have three terms, I think, uh, something like that. Uh, so I will give Sylvia more airtime than perhaps, uh, certainly I would give myself with my much thinner experience. Um, so that's part of the balance. Like, does the person know what they are talking about? Now, um, for example, there, there are issues. Oh, in the last show, we were talking about tension between staff and elected council members who has the power for decisions. Well, um, now, Sylvia wasn't on this show, but were she, had she been on, I, I would let her go on for longer without interrupting with a question than, let's say, another member who has doesn't have, you know, is just a voter. You know, not just, but is a citizen votes, but uh, has never served in council, maybe uh, been to a few meetings, that's it. So that's part of it. Uh, but at times during the show, I have to uh, cut in with a question that changes the tone a bit. And also um, at times there's, uh, there's editing that I have to do that's more or less for length. Let me give you an example. If if you ask me right now, okay, Bill, what should all levels of government do about the rise in youth crime across the country in Peterborough? There's lots of youth crime. Um, now, I happen to have worked for a period of time way back when. Uh, with the, what we used to call them uh, adjudicated youth, uh, kids who had done some time, uh, both in Quebec and Alberta. Uh, and I could answer your question and probably take 40 minutes. Uh, but you know, you, you would have figured out my answer where I stood on youth crime and what the best approach is probably in the first 
45 seconds. So, <laughs> you know, to, to try and uh, encourage that sort of concision and to talk about that informally with your guests before you start recording to say, look, some of the topics we're going to get, get into are big, they're heavy, they're complex. I mean, program, I've done a few programs on climate change and the environment. I, you know, people are, have, uh, of course, full academic careers uh, on that topic. I mean, what can you say in, in five minutes? So try to role model or try to give the example of, look, there's five points to make. We don't have time to go through them. So let me just summarize what I think is the top point and do that. But, you know, your, your question I should, is, is good. Uh, I mean, and it's, I guess at a meta level is how much do, does the host and the panelist respect each other? Right? I mean, if I'm, if you've spent your lifetime studying climate change and I'm cutting you off after two minutes, I've got to trust that you'll let me do that. And you've got to trust that because of host of the panel, I'm doing that for a good reason. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's tricky. And I, I will say it's far easier when you're face to face. Yeah. And some uh, people just take it better than others too. <laughs> uh, yeah. I, I mean, even on zoom, uh, as we are now, I mean, when you're, uh, when you're looking at each other, you're you're still not getting all the uh, all the uh, cues that uh, you know you. Uh, you want me to turn off you your do, sharing? Yeah, no, <laughs> okay. I don't. There we go. <laughs> you know, you're not getting you're not getting all the cues that um, like this. Now we're screen to screen that you are uh, mm -hmm. face to face. And I don't know what the fix is for that. Yeah, I, I, I guess somewhat related, like when like the listeners in your mind when you're doing your prep and when you're doing your editing, how much is the listener in your mind when the panel's actually going on? How much are you thinking of like how people are gonna be hearing this later when, uh, when it's happening live? Uh, not enough, <laughs> I have to say, uh, I mean, uh... I, you know, when we're listen, when we're doing one of these uh, panel discussion in the studio or face to face in a room somewhere, uh, my pretty much I'm my attention is pretty much on the conversation and where that's going. I guess the listener does come up when someone, uh, for example, we did a series of programs last fall and in January, of course, on American politics and what was going on with Trump, and mm. the uh, insurrection on six and all. Um, and I had to intervene because, well, for example, Sylvia Southern is very, you know, she's been following politics mm. for years. She's met uh, a number of, uh, you know, you know, serious American politicians in years gone by and a career in journalism. Um, and she would make reference to American governmental processes that I'm sure 80% of the audience wouldn't understand. So I'd say, what does that mean? You know, uh, so if you could explain that, please. Um, so I, I, so to that extent, whenever I hear something that's a bit esoteric or I only happen to know, or that I don't know. <laughs> you know I, I, I stop the speaker and say, could you just give us 30 seconds on what is that? Yeah, yeah try to do that. Uh, I, 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 uh, one, I've, I've thought about this as well. And like one, one way I kind of think about it is like, you kind of have to be the advocate for the listener because yes. they, don't, they don't get a voice in, in the podcast. They're just, they're, ju they're just listening. So you have to kind of yeah. be there their their presence in the room and um it, yeah. it takes a lot of thinking to think about like who is my listener and what do they know but oh um, yeah and i mean because uh, i teach communications out at fleming uh, now and then um there's the issue of who owns the english language well now mm -hmm. there's something like s between six and eight hundred million native speakers of english 
on the planet, but there's over 2 billion who speak English. Well, all the rest of those people have learned English as a second language. Well, I've been in a class and this little exercise, both students from Ontario, you know, domestic students, as we call them, and international students, uh, and this is other Fleming, uh, who are mostly from India, but also Vietnam, Cameroon, different places all around the world. And I would trot out an example about idiom. For example, uh, uh, he, he picks up a pass at center, goes to the blue line, pulls a deke, faints left, goes right, and shoots at the five hole. Now, <laughs> domestic students, if they follow hockey, will have a visual of what I was saying. Students who aren't, for whom English is not, who didn't grow up in this culture, they don't know what I'm talking about. And so to be aware of your idiom yeah. and expressions, like, uh, geez, you know, I'm almost in the bag, uh, or you know, I'm tuckered right out. Well, what does that mean? I, and so I guess it's keeping a sensitivity to, uh, I don't mean English skill levels in the sense of, uh, you know, uh, elementary school, high school, college, university, uh, that, not that at all. It's whose English is it? And mm -hmm. I try as much as possible to speak uh, an accessible international English, which uh, uh, is something I don't think even in Canadian public broadcasting, they do, they do enough with. Yeah, but on yeah. the flip side, I think it's also okay to, to, to if you think about your audience and and you kind of say like, I only want hockey fans <laughs> to listen. I, yeah. th this is a podcast for hockey fans, and if you're listening and you're not a hockey fan and you don't get this, I, that's not for me to, yeah. to deal with. Yeah. Like, oh, for sure. Yeah. It's not my target audience. Yeah, I mean, you know, doing a hockey show, of course, that little bit of babble I did would be entirely appropriate. And no apologies necessary. You know, yeah. you wouldn't be listening if you didn't know what the five hole was and what yeah. Deke is and all that. Um, but if that's not your, the subject matter of your podcast, yeah. then it's an inappropriate uh, assumption to make. Yeah, and uh, things about accent. I mean, uh, I, I've did a show once on the international student uh, student experience actually it's a podcast and uh, one student one international student said yeah and we have to deal with your food which is different from home he happened to be from india and that damn canadian accent <laughs> and, you know, and of course we have an accent uh we just don't hear it because it's like the air it's all around us so to be aware of that and try to um, I guess slow down and yeah. not use the idiomatic expressions. But, well, um, you also talked a bit about how you've done a like you've asked your audience a fair bit, like and you've asked your panelists for feedback a, a lot. So, I, how does that play into the process of like kind of honing your your podcast and honing how you how you communicate? Yeah, I mean, well, I have to say, every time I've received feedback, it's really been useful. I mean, in the beginning, the first year, I was I was clipping too much. I was trimming out like all the white space on the Audacity file. So my programs would sound like talk very quickly and not make any space and talk about brick wall. You know, it's just babble. Uh, this is what a, a, you know, a neighbor told me listening to it. He said, you know, leave more, like slow down, leave more space. And so, so it's very useful. Hmm. My one regret is I, I really like to get more of it, you know? Yeah. Uh, because, I mean, what, the wonderful thing about um, doing podcasts that come from radio programs is that you have this very supportive staff at Trent Radio who help you technically, but they say, you know, that's not their role and they don't say, well, you know, you you're going um a bit too much and yeah. could you stop repeating yourself because they're producer oriented radio they said let everyone find their own voice and i respect that 100 percent. i as a podcaster i'd like more feedback like bill this is how you can make your shows a lot more listenable yeah 
that'd be great. That's um, something, I mean, yeah, that's something we kind of want to do at PIP as well as like maybe with this like workshop series, maybe I'll reframe it as like a feedback session or something. Yeah. Like, how can we bring members together to like to collaborate and, and like encourage each other to, to like through, through constructive feedback? Yeah, yeah, like what, what are you doing right? Mm -hmm. And how could you make things better? Now, some people uh, in their podcasts don't get into the personal at all. And it's, zoom, it's like a <laughs> laser on the topic. And that's great. And others get into their life story and what they did with their grandmother when they were, growing. you know, uh, they go too far into the weeds. So yeah. where's the balance? It's also about what you're trying to go for, right? Like, it's not necessarily that like, you should make a whole, total different podcast, but like, how can you give feedback that helps someone make a better version of what they're trying to do? Yeah, and I guess it gets back to purpose and goal and all that stuff. I mean, what mm -hmm. what is the purpose of each episode? What is the purpose of your podcast yeah. in general? Now, there's some podcasts out there that are, all about community. Uh, I've listened to some podcasts made by uh, First Nations people uh, on their First Nation, and it's about building community. So they're open to everything, and they go in all sorts of different tangents and play mm -hmm. music that appeals to their listeners, maybe even by local artists or First Nations artists. Great, because that's the purpose of the program. Um, and I've listened to other, I was listening to a uh, podcast by Mark Carney. <laughs> it was this uber brilliant uh, former Bank of Canada, Bank of England, uh, chief executive uh, who's now back in Canada. He's talking about the financial crisis and how we're gonna come out of uh, the pandemic and what countries have to do. And I mean, his, he didn't get into anecdotes, although he did tell a few stories and it was very refreshing at the end when the interviewer asking him a question, got him to talk a bit about stuff outside his specialty, but mm -hmm. that appealed to me, but that would all, that sort of program would only appeal to people who have an interest in uh, you know, international finance and all yeah. that stuff. So, yeah, I, I, I guess you're, Aisha, you, you make me think that um, a really important piece to podcasting is to get really clear on what you're doing and why you're doing it totally. before yeah. so that, <laughs> you know, uh, yeah. and something, I think that helps. Yeah. So something I do now, maybe a bit, maybe I take it a little bit too far, but I, uh, I'm, I'm taking podcasting seriously with Peterborough Currents and stuff. So it's probably not too far, but like, actually going through the exercise of like doing a lot of pre-planning like what's the focus of this series yes what what do I want the listener to take away with each episode who do I imagine my listener to be like and, and getting into specifics of like I imagine them to be like a 30 to 50 year old person living in Peterborough uh with like at least some university education and um yep. how, then getting into like how long is each episode and what are some how, how do they all fit together and doing that before I even start like recording um, yes and, and, and that's not yeah. appropriate for every kind of podcast but I think oh. there is an element of like um just doing the thinking of like why am I doing this who is this for and yeah. if the answer is just like it's just for me or it's just for my mom to listen to like that's fine too but like getting kind of clear <laughs> on like because that yeah. also sets, lets you set like success metrics in an appropriate way. Like if yeah. you're, if your podcast is for your mom, then like, and, and you have one listener and it's your mom, then hooray, you've done it. But um, <laughs> if you're, if you're, if your ideal audience is your mom and you're hoping to get like 5,000 listeners, it's like, well, why? <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, there, there's some program there uh, and I don't, well, one failing is that I haven't listened to all the podcasts. Uh, well, that's a dumb statement. I, I haven't <laughs> listened to enough of the podcasts that are made by people who are on Trent Radio. Now, I know there's a few programs or have been a few programs on women's issues, on feminist issues. Uh, 
obviously, so if you're doing a program on women's issues, you're not going to appeal to middle-aged or older hockey players. Sure. Probably not. And so don't try. So, you know, so that gives you a focus. On the other hand, as you were talking, I was thinking that one point of confusion is when we think of there are hosts and there are hosts. I mean, there's radio hosts who host a show that's sort of nice to listen to as you're driving somewhere because they're chatting about this and that. They say, how was your day? What do you think the weekend's going to be like? Oh, I heard this. There's this new play coming to town. It's really supposed, you know, that sort of chattiness. And that's very appealing mm -hmm. if that's what you want to do. But then you can't drill down into international economics sure. for yeah. example yeah. Yeah. because that's a different beast and so yeah uh, you do you've said it already but to be very clear it's okay to have a, a sort of chit chatty uh you know uh casual friendly open sort of show and i i've listened listened to some of those and if the host is really into it and they have the occasional guest who shares that you know, they can go all sorts of different directions and it's fun. Yeah. But they're not doing a, a program on uh, homelessness in Toronto and what's going on and why were the police so brutal, you know, and, yeah. and what to do about that, you know, which I mean, has to be more focused. Companionship is like a perfectly acceptable oh, yeah. thing to come out of, like for the listener to experience out of a, out of a show. Exactly. And it's okay to have podcasts that uh, someone who maybe is a bit lonely enjoy listening to. That's fine. Exactly. Yeah. But, uh, you know, they, they don't have to be informative graduate seminars and something, you know. Yeah. But I, I, it, when, uh, when Will and I did the Budget Week podcast for Peterborough Currents, we kind of went into it with a sense of like, we want to sound friendly. Like we're taking this like yeah. boring municipal topic uh, that like, you know, yeah. reading budgets is like total, like someone else does that. I don't do that kind of like for, <laughs> for a lot of the audience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. But we wanted to turn it into something that was like nice to listen to. Like we wanted it to just be like a pleasant experience. And yeah, so that's you can have like a friendly listening, chatty podcast that does talk about serious topics and that can be a strategy. Um, yeah. I mean, one thing I have yet to do on a podcast or a Trent Radio is have sort of a phone in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we did that for Peter Brokerance. It was- uh, How did that work? <laughs> well, Jeff helped as well. Um, I don't know if Jeff is uh, still at his computer listening, but uh, so Jeff oh, helped. Uh, Jeff helped uh, kind of screen calls, so people would call into the office line. Wait, how did it work, Jeff? Do you remember? Um, so they would call into. The, there were two lines. There's one that's for the office, and one that's for the the radio. Um, they would call into the office line, and by some magic, we could bridge it through. So I would call them, put them on hold, patch them into the radio phone line, and then uh, you would pick them up whenever you had a chance. Yeah. This was right at the time, though, that Trent Radio's phone lines were, like, absolute, like, sh sh shaky as hell whether the on-air line was going to work, and it was just, like, weird yeah. tech problems, so... Yeah, they were it, suffering. Yeah, yeah, when we got people on the air, it was great. There was also a lot of like fumbling and like uh, inconvenience. <laughs> I've been thinking a lot lately about like how would you do um, like an online phone-in show? Like how could you do like a Zoom yeah. version of like a panel discussion where audience members can ask a ask like a political figure questions. I haven't totally come, I haven't come up with an answer and I haven't pursued it that far, but I think it's an interesting, I think it'd be an interesting program. I, I'd like to see um, someone utilize Discord for that. You could have, for example, a pre-screening voice channel. And then once they were pre-screened, you'd give them like a role that allowed them to participate in the main channel kind of thing. Right. That makes I'm, sense. I'm, I'm sure Zoom has a way to maybe like via breakout rooms, Zoom oh, really? could be utilized in that way. So I, I've never done a live stream podcast episode. I mean, all, all mine are recorded and then mm -hmm. edited and then they're posted as well, but you can do that. That's technically possible. Yeah. Um, I, the way I would think would be easiest to do it is to do something like Zoom and um, cause Zoom, 
like our account right now like I could start live streaming to YouTube right this very second um oh really yeah and I think you can also live stream to Facebook oh but you're live you're live streaming to to a a platform like Facebook or YouTube yes you're Um, not just out there in the universe um like as just an audio file you mean like a streaming audio file well, there's a there's a pro. I have this program on my phone called Radio Garden. Oh, I see. Which you can go around the world listening to oh, radio okay. stations. I mean, I, yeah. I I sometimes have fun going to places I've visited in the real world and listening to the radio station. Yeah. yeah. Well, and I did a thing. I did a thing last year called um, the Reve. It's like a it's like an audio art project where they have people from all around the world do a live stream of the dawn chorus so of bird singing oh, in the spring right. um so i was able to set up like a live stream audio file it was like an og ogg um file wow. that was like live from my house like four seconds delayed or something and um streamed to a server on the internet that was hosted by this group called reve or, or sound camp and um and that was available globally Yep. Wow. And uh, I don't know if you, I, I suspect it wouldn't show up like automatically in any of those like listen to radio around the world things. Yeah. But if you had it up and running, you could probably submit it to those places. Um, right. And then wow. something I think something similar is how Trent Radio gets their online radio. Um, yeah, I don't. Well, Trent Radio is a good example. They're on Soundgarden. I mean, sometimes right. in my. I, I've gone on to, or not Soundgarden, Radio Garden. I've gone in and you can move this dot around. Unfortunately, it's not a laptop application, but uh, otherwise I could share it, but you can move this dot, this circle around on a map of the world, stop on a town and you get a list of the town's radio stations. Hmm. So I grew up in Montreal, so I listen to all Montreal's radio stations. There's 108 of them. Peterborough, there's, I think, eight stations and Trent Radio is one of them and so when you click on Trent Radio you get their uh their live stream feed yeah right so I mean that's 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 fascinating you know so someone if you were a Trent grad living in Brazil or (laughs) overseas you know in Europe you you could listen to Trent Radio (laughs) yeah it's pretty amazing all 700 watts of it you know (laughs) Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah that's amazing yeah well we're five minutes past three so maybe we'll let's think about wrapping it up but thank you so much for this presentation bill it's lots to think of it and i think i second so much of uh of of the advice you were giving and the mistakes but i it's funny learning by doing because you just uh you you end up making those mistakes but you learn so much by uh oh it's great and i mean uh pip i mean Peterborough is a great town to explore this stuff because of yourselves. I mean, how you help out podcasters. I mean, you know, I could have never, it would have taken a lot of blood, sweat and tears to get, you know, yeah. my WordPress site up and functional or not you know, Jeff, yourself, other people helped me out. And um, on the, on the uh, audio side, uh, you know, Trent radio, I mean, it's a great resource. And so, the two organizations together, I mean, are so, there's so much learning to be had that, uh, yeah, be need of more people. I, th- I think more people are beginning to come around to it, but it's uh, yeah, great stuff. So. Yeah, and we're hoping to do some more programming that to bring people together in a constructive way. Yeah, uh, that's good. Over the next few, few months um, and going into the future. So, yeah. Um, thanks for this. Uh, for okay, well, show. thank you. Okay, well, enjoy it.